This is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. And I'm here with my significant other, Frank Santo Padre. <laughs> what? And, and we're once again recording at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an Emmy-winning writer-producer, TV host, occasional actor, and fellow showbiz historian. He's written hit sitcoms like Coach, primetime specials like Earth to America, and the Peabody-winning A Tribute to Heroes, produced comedy series like the Jeff Garland Program, and The Winklers, and acted in feature films like Spanglish, The Simpsons Movie, and Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. For nine memorable seasons, he was the creative force behind one of the most popular and enduring comedies in television history, Everybody Loves Raymond, a show nominated for over 70 Emmy Awards. In a very busy career, he's worked with Tom Hanks, George Clooney, Norman Lear, Charles Durning, Martin Short, Carl Reiner, Robert Mitchum, Peter O'Toole, and former President Bill Clinton, among dozens of others. And yet there's more. He's also the author of the book, You're Lucky You're Funny, How Life Becomes a Sitcom the writer and director of the documentary Exporting Raymond and the host of the PBS food and travel series I'll Have What Phil's Having which won a James Beard Award. I think Elsa Lanchester once was nominated for a Beard Award. (laughs) Totally different thing. His anticipated new Netflix series Somebody Feed Phil takes him from Thailand to Tel Aviv in search of new experiences, cuisine and culture. Please welcome one of the funniest and nicest people in show business and a man who once auditioned for the same show as yours truly, our pal Phil Rosenthal. Wow. I left a half hour ago. <laughs> it's a long intro, Phil. You've done Holy a lot. Holy cow. Wow. <coughs> You've done I a lot of stuff. I I'm much older than when you started. Tell Gilbert, tell uh, uh, Phil how you usually think those intros should end. I, I, I always feel like they should end found dead in his Los Angeles <laughs> apartment. <laughs> That's very good. Let's Please, get, let's can get you do a, that for me? Yeah. <laughs> Redo let, it. Add, add that. That'll let, be nice. Let's get it out of the way. What did you guys both audition for? Because you told me over the phone, Phil. Gilbert, I wonder if you remember this. I don't so far. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember there was a show, I'm going to say in the early 80s, maybe the mid 80s, there was an off-Broadway show and it was a National Lampoon review of some kind. I don't remember the name of the show, but I know it was National Lampoon something. You remember auditioning? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> was it Gilbert? Who's, old, who's older, you or me? <laughs> I, I, that's really funny because I remember you walking in there. It was just you and me going to this callback, and you were either before or after me. And I remember meeting you briefly and you were very sweet, but you were very crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, late 80s, did you that, say, Phil? I want to say mid, mid-80s, mid early 80s. 80s. Mid that, 80s. That should be the title of my autobiography. Very sweet, very but sweet, very crazy. But very crazy. Yeah. You but do, I, uh, I don't remember the show. I do remember not getting it. I, and I was going <laughs> to ask you if you got it, but I'm guessing I, you didn't get it either I because obviously, you don't remember. I would have remembered something about it had I got it. I would have it. remembered a f- successful stage career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But were you were you auditioning a lot in those days as an actor? Uh, uh not so much as an actor. I would get some auditions here and there. Yeah. But an agent was sending you out and doing things cuz uh, I I I didn't even I couldn't even get an agent. Oh, I I mean, it, it was like so few and far between. Yes. People think people are under this image that I oh, I remember being at William Morris in the elevator and some young attractive girl is the only other person in the elevator. And it sounds like it's going into a hustler letter. <laughs> I I never thought I'd be writing this. <laughs> no, but she actually yells hooray. And which I've never heard someone actually use the word <laughs> hooray. And she Hooray. goes, I have an agent. And I thought, well, you know, that and an application for McDonald's <laughs> uh, should go hand in hand. They think having an agent is the the end all. Well, when it's so hard to get an agent, in some ways it is. Yeah. You, you feel like at least now someone will send me out on things because there's no other way. Yeah. You, I mean, you have to wait for the open calls, right? Yeah. I don't think people know this. Too many people know about you, Phil. That you that you uh, you kind of stumbled into wanting to be an actor. You just wanted to be funny. You 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 didn't really have any exactly. clear clear designs on being a character actor or anything like that. I mean, obviously, people know you from Raymond and as a writer, but you started out kind of knocking around auditions. Well, when you're a kid, you know, when you watch TV, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't know there was writing and directing and producing. I I watched the Honeymooners and I wanted to be them. Right. I just wanted to be funny. Right. And so when you're in school, the only the only way to do that is to, without getting thrown out of class is to be in the school plays. So that's what I did, and I thought that's what I'll do. And then I went to college for that, and I, I was a I was a very big hit in high school and college. I mean, there was no bigger star than me in my <laughs> high school and college. And then I graduated, moved to New York, and nobody cared. <laughs> that's pretty much it. It it's yeah. kind of like. When the prettiest girl in her hometown go moves to L.A., yes, you realize that was there me. are gorgeous girls working in the laundromats out there. That's right. I was the prettiest girl. Did you know shows were written at, at an early age? Like Phil was Phil I, I kind talking of, about. Yeah, I kind of understood. Yeah, yeah, that there were writers and stuff. I remember thinking, I knew. I had seen trailers, you know, that that uh, actors uh, were in. Like, yeah. I mean, a, a, you know, a, a movie trailer. Uh, right. You know, the, with the wheels on it, not a coming oh, not attraction. A coming attraction, right. And and I, I remember, I think as a little kid, I thought every actor lived in those. And it was a small area where they all lived next to each other. That's cute. And I think like the Jack Benny show, they all knocked on each other's doors. <laughs> that, that, was how, that was how you imagined yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and it, and it was like, uh, well, what do you know? It's Jimmy Stewart. You know? <laughs> Just drop by. Yeah. Well, TV perpetuated that. Yeah, in a they way. They always said uh, on Lucy, it looked like everybody knew everybody. On all the On the Jackie Gleason show, everybody was pals, right? And Phil was hardcore. He even liked the Jackie Gleason Variety Show. Oh, my God, yeah. From Miami Beach. Now, the Absolutely. Jackie Gleason Variety Show, what I love there is that was that time period, along with Dean Martin and stuff, where uh, drinking and smoking were the coolest things in the world. They just did it. That's how they, that's every other breath was a drink and a smoke. That's it. Yeah, or oh, the Carson show. He was always lighting oh, up. Yes, yeah. and, and you'd see Gleason always like taking a sip out of a coffee cup and yeah. and making a face like like ooh, that's good ooh. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and then he would have the cigarette, and it looked like the coolest guy on the planet. Uh, I I love them. I really love them. I love those shows. You were attracted to the the, the more uh, realistic sitcoms. You were more like an, a honeymooners, odd couple yes. kind of guy. You didn't go in for the kind of fantastic '60s television like the, the the genies and the Mister Eds and the Bewitched. You like comedy that was grounded in 
in reality and, and character. I watched all those, but, you know, that's because they were on. Sure. That was my criteria. Is it on? <laughs> I'll watch it. But I love the shows that were grounded and took place on planet Earth. Right. And didn't that's break reality for, for, for joke's sake. Right. Now, we, w- we were talking, Bill Persky, he was complaining about certain TV shows where the joke is the main thing. Like, right. like, <laughs> like the story and situation is just a supporting thing for the joke that's coming up, is what he hated. So if you do, if you do that and if you're joke-based... You're only as good as your last joke. Pretty yes. much. Right. Right. But if you build characters that you believe, you can go anywhere with them. You know, one of my favorite moments in TV history is when Art Carney gets, uh, there's an accident in the sewer. Oh, and, yeah. And Norton is hurt. And, and Ralph has that reaction. Well, that moment had never happened in The Honeymooners before. And my, my heart, I remember, I was like five, six. My heart just broke. I couldn't believe it that something happened to my beloved character, to Art Carney, to Ed Norton. And, and of and course, you know, yeah. Go ahead. Then I, I remember Ed Norton says, he goes, oh, it was nothing. A manhole fell. A manhole cover fell on my head. Occupational <laughs> hazard. Exactly right. The sword. <laughs> yeah, that's the word. A manhole cover just fell on my head. He signs up for the transfusion and he goes exactly. by on, those, oh, on yes, the gurney yes. and he gives Norton a wave. <laughs> Norton waves and then he comes out. Bah! What are you doing? Just great stuff. Oh, and then Norton says, you thought I was hurt. Well, you're my pal. Right? So it was yes. so like affirming, life affirming even to me. I loved it so much and that stayed with me. What are you doing here? I was just about to go home. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I'm here to give you a transfusion in there. You were going to give me a transfusion. You thought I was hurt. Only a guy's greatest pal would do that for him. I'm telling you, you, you you're one of nature's noblemen. <laughs> Ralph, I, I'll, I'll never forget this as long as I live. So, Crampton, uh, patient's ready. Will you come in now, please? <laughs> okay. Uh, see you later, Norton. Okay. Ralph. Okay, Ralph. Hey, uh, uh, Doc... Uh, while you got him in there, will you see what you can do about getting that ring off his finger? Where are you? <laughs> that's what, that's life. You know, it's not all laugh, joke, 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 joke. We have those moments, and those moments serve to also ground the characters and make you care about them. It also, when you have the dramatic moment, in contrast, it makes the next funny moment all the funnier. Right, because it's an emotional release, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're watching Art Carney, you're watching The Honeymooners, you're not quite, you, you describe yourself as a kid who watched way too much television. You're, oh, yeah, you're that's not, all I did. You're not quite. Because pro- when I went outside, I got hit. <laughs> I was telling Gilbert a little bit about that. Some bullies. I'm guessing Gilbert a little similar, maybe, Gilbert? No, no, I was a tough, cool guy who got laid constantly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was like James Dean. <laughs> it's now that you get hit. Uh, <laughs> there was some bullying going on, Phil? Oh, my goodness, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm not careful, it could happen tonight. <laughs> Let's hope now, not. Now, here's something that, that's, because bullying's become a big topic. Yeah. And, you know, it is terrible, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but <laughs> that's so, the very sensitive. That's Gilbert's ad. Yeah, blah, blah, <laughs> it's blah. This is PSA. Yes. <laughs> the more you know. Yes. And, but, is bullying kind of, a way of growing up and building uh, strength and a courage about you. I I don't know about you, but I think there's two reasons why people go into comedy. 
One is so you're not hit by the bully. Yeah. And two is maybe that girl will like me if I make her laugh. Oh yeah. Right? Yes. So those are the two things. I think that's it. I don't know why else you do it. Yeah, and and I realized making a girl laugh isn't worth shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did get a wife out of it. <laughs> Phil, I, 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 but, I, but maybe you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard you on with Brian Koppelman, and uh, you said that uh, women are— ba- Another Jew. Yeah, another Jewish guy. <laughs> we had Brian here. You said women are lying when they say that a sense of humor is most important in a guy, when they, when they used to say that in Playboy magazine? Yeah. Well, Gilbert just said it, right? It's not worth <laughs> shit. It's 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 they say it is. They say, "Oh, I love a funny guy," but they don't they go they go and date the guy on the motorcycle with the jacket. Yeah, it it's it's like my favorite quote from anyone in that subject was uh Rachel Hunter, who was a supermodel. Oh, with Rod Stewart. Yeah, yeah. she married Rod Stewart and she said in an article Rod Stewart is living proof that a man can laugh you into bed. So the fact that he was an international superstar (laughs) rock singer had nothing to do with this. It was all, he just had the funniest, like, I, I remember when I read that, I think, you know, I don't claim to be the greatest God's gift to mankind, but I think I have funnier material than Rod Stewart. I'm sure you yeah. do. Good luck with that. <laughs> Here's another thing that made me think of you, Gilbert, when I heard an interview with Phil. He was saying he doesn't understand uh, people who are still miserable even after they've, they've enjoyed success. Shouldn't, oh. shouldn't success make you nicer? No. Should not. <laughs> it, it, if, if your dreams come true, shouldn't you be a little nicer? You would think so. Uh, no, because what happens is that thing of, oh, I, I thought it would be the way I pictured it. And yeah. it's never the way you picture it. What did you it. picture? I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, Rachel Hunter. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, that was number one. And you it don't was, have that. And it was two and three. He has a beautiful <laughs> wife. And and I I remember, oh, I thought... Like, it was kind of like when I signed the thing with the devil, that if you're famous and in show business, there's you're never depressed, you're never sick, nothing bad will ever happen to you right. if, you're a, if you're a celebrity. Right. And then when you realize bad stuff does happen, you go, wait a minute. This is what I signed on for. <laughs> you thought celebrities were even was, more depressed. It yes. was, was going to make you invincible somehow. Yes, and, and just, yes. I see. But I, I know. And yes, I get depressed. I'm a person. But you have to step back a little bit and say, look how lucky. Look how lucky we are. Well, there are people who work for a living. Hey, oh. Real work. <laughs> I, I, I always think whenever I start bitching yeah. about my showbiz career – I always think if my father was alive now and me telling him, well, oh, it was so awful. They yeah. flew me out there to do this TV show. <laughs> I made this amount of money. And, uh, oh, you know, one time their lunch, they were five minutes late That's delivering right. it to my trailer. Yes. And, yes. and it get hit by him. Yeah. yeah. And, and I rightly so. He was a guy Whose hands got dirty. He ran a hardware yes. store. Yeah. So. Yes. Gilbert's father. But there's millions of people who, do, we, we are the, I used to say after like uh, a taping of our uh, Raymond show, the next day when we gather for the table reading, I'd say, I got to tell, I hope you understand, we are not the lucky people. We are the very, very, very lucky people. That's Absolutely. honestly yeah. how I feel, that we get to do this. And that people come to see us, and then they laugh, and they watch our TV show, and then they pay us way more, I think, than what teachers are worth, right? Of course. Yeah, it's insane. Things are out of whack, world. really. And I They're always, out of whack, so we should never, ever complain, ever. You got that, Gilbert? Out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always think of my father, and I yeah. thought, wow, if I told him this shit 
that that I was depressed about in show yes. business. Yes. Yeah, he 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 could have. I would welcome him kicking the shit out of me for it. But we're Jews, and so the the body at rest complains. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask if that's a Jewish thing because I heard you say, Phil, they always find the negative. And I'm a well, Gentile, I so I can't I connect. I wouldn't say they. I would say everyone I know who's Jewish. Right. <laughs> including me. <laughs> so you're a Jew? I never. You hide it very well. <laughs> uh, and and it's a, a rarity. I should to, take a lesson from you. It's a rarity f- to find Jews in TV comedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the irony is he wrote a show that was an Italian guy and it was yeah. real it was really f- in your family. Yeah, big big difference. Right. Big well, difference. Yeah. Jews and Italians. Yeah. Right? I've- All problems are solved with food and the mother, the mother never leaves you alone. <laughs> it's the same. Well, we're all the same. It it's so funny that a lot of shows were like that. Well, like the Costanzas. Right. They were a, a family of Jews with an Italian name. <laughs> I, never understood, <laughs> I never understood how Larry David became Italian. Yes. The whole, <laughs> the whole series, everybody's Jewish. The whole, all of them are Jews. Yeah. Yes. They're all Jews. It's about four Jews. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell America. <laughs> you know, well, they say, write, write Yiddish, cast British. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it was... When Mary Tyler Moore was first going on the air. Not uh, a Jew. Not, oh, not a Jew. Oh, boy, was she ever not. <laughs> <laughs> and and they were originally going to make her a divorced woman. And, yeah, correct. And the studio said, no, we can't make you a divorcee because there are two things that the world hates, divorcees and Jews. Oh, God. <laughs> And you know who's saying that? The Jews. Jewish Network executive. <laughs> exactly. Right. Always. Always. It's true. So We hate ourselves, even. <laughs> so, Phil, just to fill our, our listeners in, so you, you, you love these shows. You knew you wanted to be funny. You wanted to be Art Carney. You, you, uh, you tried your hand at acting for a while, and, and gradually— I was a failure. And you, well, you do, you, 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 one of the people who created Tony and Tina's wedding, which was a significant thing. That was a kind of a transition. We wrote a show for ourselves to be in. Yeah. That was a smart move. Looking and then, back. and then I didn't know that, 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 that we could do such a thing, but desperation leads you to these things. I also, at the same time, a, a very dear friend of mine, Alan Kirschenbaum came to my, uh, apartment with a big blue and gray metal box. I said, what's that? He goes, it's called a word processor. This is 1987, right? He says, we're going to write a screenplay. I don't know anything about that. He goes, here, it's, a, it's not hard. I kind of know what an outline is, and we can, let's, let's write it. And we wrote it. It took a few months. We had a ball doing it because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We uh-huh. didn't know how bad we were or good we were. We just didn't know. We were just doing it for fun. Well, we sold that screenplay. We sold it to HBO. Now, remember, this is 30 years ago for $70,000. I had $200 in the bank, right? 70,000. We split $70,000. I was now a thousand air. Right. I couldn't believe it. And so I went from eating tuna fish for dinner as an actor to eating whatever I wanted. (laughs) (laughs) So this writing thing could work out. Yes. Didn't your mom, was it your mom or dad who said, you know how long in life we have, to, we have to save to, to, to put away $70,000? She she went, my father was like doing the whole on the roof. He was so excited that I made so much money all of a sudden. And my mother, why is your father so excited? She got on the phone. I said, we made, what do you get for something like that? I said, we're going to split $70,000. She said, she got, there was, the phone went silent. And she said, do you know we've worked our whole lives to have that in the bank? That's amazing. It was almost wow. like, like you little shit. Yeah. You all you do is you you make your stupid jokes and the world rewards you like that. That shouldn't be. So I feel like you know your dad would feel right. Yes. Like like you never worked a day in your life. He thinks. <laughs> yeah. 
and and it's like that story that you just told. That's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. Did your dad yeah. see a little of your success, Gil? Uh, no, it, my father comic? didn't see any of it. Right, right. Yeah. That's a shame. That's too bad. That's a shame. But you know that they are they are proud of you. They love you. They that all we want is for our kids to do well, but they just can't believe the way the world works. And why was it unfair to us? Yeah. Feel, right? Oh, absolutely. Alan can't was a very it. A very funny guy, Alan, and Freddie Roman's yeah. son, by the way, uh, Alan Kirshenbaum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a writer yeah. who accomplished a lot of things in TV. That's right. And a, fu- and he, and a funny man. He was man. my absolute mentor. He was, even even though he was a year behind me in high school, uh, we we were best friends, and, and he he's the one who actually got me started in writing. He was, he was the one who encouraged me, and I wouldn't be anywhere without him. Mm-hmm. He taught me the structure. He, he made it into sitcoms before I did and thought I could do this. And I never took a class in such a thing, but he taught me in five minutes the structure of a sitcom. And I guess I had an affinity for it because of all the television I watched instead of going outside it was of in your girls. In your body, yeah. inside of you by that point. Yes. Now, yes. what are some of your complaints about yeah. when you watch a, a sitcom on TV? It's stupid and vulgar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the, 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 it's easy to make those jokes and too many shows get away with those jokes. And, and that, that's, that's what passes for the laughs. When, when, when a, when a, a scene opens and right away they're saying vagina. Yeah. That's easy. You know, I, I mean, I get it in certain circumstances, but when that's all there is. I'm sorry. It's just, it's not that I'm a prude. It's just not so funny. We did a show on Raymond where the mother goes to sculpture class. Oh, it's a great one. And she makes a giant sculpture of, and it looks like a vagina. We never said the word once. Never said it because we made a conscious decision. Wouldn't it be funnier to let the audience fill it in what that kind of looks like? All we did was we had somebody goes, it it, it looks like, it looks like, and the audience is like, are they going to say it? Are they going to say it? The studio audience, they're like, where are they going with this? And somebody whispers into the other character's ear. And then you see their face and then look at it again. And the whole audience filled it in. It was so much more satisfying to say it without saying it. Yeah. And it was such a deeper laugh. And that carried through the whole show. We never said the word once. It was just now you've set up the way the audience is going to react to that thing. Right? It was a communal laugh. Yeah, a- I, I remember seeing, uh, like, you know, one of these reruns of I Love Lucy. Yeah. And the whole show, she couldn't find her wedding ring. Yeah. And then she's having, she's eating a cake that she baked that morning. And then you see her make a face and swallow something painfully. Yes. And the yes. end joke is that the ring was in the cake and she swallowed it. Right. And that was the end. And I thought, wow, nowadays at the shitting beginning. Shitting the ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> shitting the ring. Exactly. Right. Yep. The end, she'd swallow it at the beginning. Yep. And then she'd be taking laxative and enemas. <laughs> and they'd be jokes about digging through the shit. And, yeah. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> Look who I'm talking to about going blue. You are right. <laughs> exactly. You are. I mean, can I just stop the show for a sure. second to 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 compliment you? I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as your run with Norm Macdonald about the the combination that you did of sexual act with the disease that you were going to get yes. and whether that was worth it. Yeah. I thought that was one of the greatest runs in the history of comedy. I really do. Oh, uh, you're, thank you're such you. a genius at this stuff because of the way you speak and the way you look and the way you don't expect this stuff to come out of your mouth. And then it does in the most outrageous ways, but the audience still knows you're a sweetheart and you're not a vulgar person. And yet you're saying the grossest things imaginable. <laughs> I just love you. Oh, I that thank nice. you. I'm not sure those are mutually exclusive, that he's a sweetheart but not a vulgar person. 
Was that when you, did that have the Catherine Zeta Jones bit oh, mixed yeah. in there? Yeah. yeah. God, that was. That That's was, a, so as I funny recommend as... everybody listening to yeah, go, it's, go, it's, go on YouTube and look at that. Yeah, it's Gilbert from a bit McDonald. I do in my act. It's as funny as you've yeah. ever been. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is tremendous. Phil, I love Norm. Norm is awesome. A very yes. funny man. Phil, tell us about so so Kirschenbaum comes into your life and you sell a script yeah. and and suddenly you're yeah. a, you're a big time writer. You sold a script to HBO. It never got made. Right. You know we wrote Still. it. We have it. That, so 1987, we write it for our favorite actor. It's a suburban detective, and we write it for Alan Arkin, and we wow. sell it to HBO. Yeah, and HBO promptly says, "Great script. Uh, who are you going to cast?" And we said, Alan Arkin. And they said, he doesn't open a movie. The end. <laughs> oh, gee. And that was that. <laughs> and then we got a call from somebody who had gotten the script somehow, wanted to meet with us, thought it was perfect script. Let's go. All right, we'll take the meeting with Jerry Lewis. If you look in the dictionary, the opposite of Alan Arkin <laughs> is Jerry Lewis. <laughs> I have not heard this story, but I was going to ask you about Jerry Lewis. So this is well, what now, happened. Well, now that he's passed, I can tell the story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good, good timing. It was unbelievable. Uh, he was, it, uh, it's a suburban detective and he, he, he's, he's uh, am I telling tales out of school? He was, he could be pompous a little bit. Did you ever, <laughs> did it, did it, Do tell. Did, did you did you ever deal with him? Did you ever meet him? I I met him a couple of times, and I can happily say that famous line. Uh, well, he was always nice to me. Great. <laughs> yes. By the way, very nice to me too. Yeah. He thought we were so talented. We were kids, right? Yeah. He called us kids. He called us little pishers, right? <laughs> But he said, this script we could film tomorrow. He couldn't have been nicer to us. Yeah. But at the same time, he was holding court of at course. lunch. And he said, now let me tell you, I see this character. I always see him as Jerry number three. I'm like, <laughs> what? And he goes, he goes, so for what I mean is like, let's say the character is a waiter. And I'm like, yeah, inside I'm thinking, but he's not a waiter. He's a <laughs> And he says, if he's Jerry, if and, and if he was Jerry number one, it'd be like this. And he stands up over me and he goes, oh, I like this. Did, did you want a thing? And he knocks over my water and his chair falls over. I'm sorry. La, la, la. <laughs> That's Jerry one. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, Jerry, th Jerry three is this. And he resets my water. He resets the chair, uh. and he does the whole thing again. Oh, would you like your water? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I knocked my chair over. He just does everything he just <laughs> did, just slowly. <laughs> That's Jerry three. And I'm looking at Alan, and we're just I just got to Hollywood. You know, I can't believe I'm meeting Jerry Lewis, but this is insane. Right. Yes. It's great. And this is not going to be good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he did make you laugh because it was him and it was like, you know, waiter came over, I have dessert, and he would just stop the conversation and he'd go, cookie, I love a cookie. <laughs> and so you laugh because he's doing Jerry Lewis right in front of you for you. That was like that. But uh, he goes, uh, somebody mentioned France or Paris, and he, he just goes, Paris, hey, that's my room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, it. I remember all this stuff. This was, you know, 1989. Wow. I remember well, every second. I, I, I remember hearing him in an interview go when he was doing The Nutty Professor, he said, what disturbed me about the Buddy Love character huh. is how I was able to perform it. And I thought, could there be a tiny part of my personality that's like Buddy Love? <laughs> Holy shit. 
<laughs> Holy shit. Self-aware. <laughs> he had no clue that he was Buddy Luck. <laughs> Not a clue. <laughs> it's amazing. It is. Isn't it? Was there a Jerry 2? He gave you Jerry 1 and Jerry 3. I has- I'm going to say a little faster than Jerry 3, <laughs> not as fast as Jerry 1. That's my guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a great story. He goes, I could get this financed in France in two minutes. <laughs> And he promptly didn't. <laughs> and we never saw him again. Did you ever meet Alan Arkin and tell him you had this thing back in the day for him? I've never met Alan Arkin. I love Alan. Who doesn't love Alan Oh, Arkin? well, we got to oh, make it a mission know, to get this down. Him, him and uh, uh, Walter Matthau, yeah. my favorite. Gilbert, oh, Gilbert shares your love of Walter Matthau. Yeah. Oh, Walter Matthau. Come on. Can you, can you believe kids today, they don't know who he is? Uh, well, Isn't that sad? Well, sad. we were at, uh, at lunch with someone who we mentioned Groucho Marx. Oh, yeah. And this girl had no idea who Groucho Marx was. Well, in fairness, she was 22 or something, or 23 or something. Yeah. But still. But listen, uh, kids don't know who John Belushi is even, so so forget Groucho. Yeah. Right? Favor Phil with a little of your your Walter Matthau. He'll appreciate it. For six months, I lived alone in this apartment. I was despondent, disgusted, and alone. And then you walked in, my dearest and closest friend. And after three months of close personal contact, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. (laughs) Oh, my God. I love it. It's so, uh, I just, who's funnier than him in the, in the Sunshine Boys? Oh, oh just great. great. And, and How great it, is that? And Matthau and Arkin, yeah. what they also have in common is when they're in a dramatic role, they can make you laugh. That's There's right. something so naturally oh, yeah. funny Ma- about Matthau and well, Charlie, Charlie Varick. He's, Ma- he's Matthau funny. Matthau had the world's greatest face. Yes. You know, it looked like three pounds of flunkin on his face. <laughs> And and it just did like a like a what are those dogs? The droopy dog. Oh, the sharp oh, yes. the sharpe. Yeah, it yeah. was like that. Well you got, to meet, him, so you, you got to, got meet to meet him. I got to meet him. I got to meet him. I got to meet I couldn't believe it. This is the most Hollywood story. I go, I'm with Alan. We're coming on the lot at Universal. And outside the guard gate, as we're waiting to drive in, it's Walter Matthau. He's standing. Nobody stands outside the guard gate. He's standing outside the guard gate. I'm like, Alan, it's Walter Matthau. Whoa, whoa. Rolled down the window. I said, hello, sir. Can we say hello to you? And he leans this giant body into our car. He's in the car. His Half his body is in the car. And he says, hello, boys. And I said, oh, my God, I love you so much. You're, you're my favorite actor. And now... There's a honk behind us because we're at the guard gate. People are waiting behind the thing. And he leans his body outside the car and turns to the traffic and he goes, can't you see we're having a conversation? (laughs) And then he leans his body back into the car. You were saying? Fantastic. And I'm crying because he's my hero because I love this man so much. It was so, oh my God, I just, uh, he's the sweetest, greatest, funniest. He's everything you want in a person. You, you, you never met him, Gil? I, I, I no. urge people, please yeah. go watch. Do you know br- the Broadway production of The Odd Couple? Was him. Oh, yeah. Yes. And Carney. And Carney. And Art Carney. Can you imagine? As If I could go back to one production in history, it would yeah. be to go see that show. Us too. Right? Uh, us too. And can you imagine a better thing? I remember being at an event with Walter Matthau, but I never officially met him. And I remember being thrilled, like, because he's Walter Matthau. Yeah. And oh, and I yeah. remember in The Odd Couple, there's one part where he, uh, Jack Lemon calls him to ask if he wants him to make coleslaw. <laughs> and he misses an important major play at the ball game. Oh, sure. He misses he goes, a triple play. Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
That's a great math, though. <laughs> you got to see that, and you got to see the Sunshine Boys, and you got to see everything you ever did. Oh, and the fortune That's cookie. All. The fortune cookie. Yeah, we could, we could give recommendations uh, all day. Yes. He's even good as a heavy in charade. Turns yep. up turns up as a bad guy. Very good yep. in that. Yeah, and Don Siegel's Charlie Varick, if you haven't seen it recently, yep. is absolutely terrific. Where where you say he manages to be light and funny in in a non oh, yes. in, in a non comedic part. And and, and I, even I, though I, those movies with Glenda Jackson, like House Calls. And, oh, and, oh and, yeah, House, House Calls is good. He's Very so charming funny. and great, right? Yeah, yeah. always and, good. And I remember in the Odd Couple too, when he doesn't want Felix to kill himself, when yeah. Felix says. You know, is this the 12th floor? And he goes, no, no, it's not the 12th floor. It's the 11th. You would only heard yourself here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then later on, when Felix pisses him yeah. off because right. he ruins a date with the Pigeon Sisters, Matthau is walking past and he swings the window open, wide open. And he goes... It's the 12th floor, not the 11th. <laughs> but even a movie that has no business being funny, like Grumpy Old Men. Yeah. He's hilarious. Yes. He's always good. Always good. Oh, I don't think there was Makes ever a bad performance. Plaza Suite, we could go on. I think we're doing a public service by yeah. turning your younger listeners on to this guy. Oh, we do all the time. Tell that wonderful story about the reading of The Sunshine Boys when Burns came in. Because it was originally Benny. That's that's exactly right. So so it was going to be Jack Benny and Walter Matthau. And they must, I think they filmed for two weeks. Yeah, there's, Where's there's that footage. It, there's, I need that film. I think there's oh, something on God. YouTube. Where can I see? Because Jack Benny, another one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. Where is that footage? But anyway, Jack Benny dies. They shut down for a while while they try to convince Jack Benny's best friend to take over, George Burns. And George had to be really talked into it. And George Burns was now very, very old, older than Walter Matthau, certainly, by maybe 10 years. And they didn't know if he could do it or not. And he finally agrees and comes the table reading for the movie, the first day of the movie. And everyone's gathered around the table and they start to read. And George Burns' character doesn't enter till page 25 or something. But he's not, he's not, he's just sta staring straight ahead at the table. He's not opening his script. So as they get closer and closer to page 25, everybody's looking at each other like, are you going to tell him to open the script? You know, the, somebody taking care of George and nobody has the balls to say anything. And here it is. It's page 24. He's still not opening the script. And then his cue line comes and he nails the line without looking, and he never opens the script, and he knows the whole script on day one by heart. Wow. Wow. How about that? And the people were floored. And cut to George Burns wins an Oscar. He sure did. For that role. He sure did. Yes. Yes. Ultimate pro. Yeah. Did you ever meet George? No. No. We so, so when I first got to town, I'm um, um, working at uh, Hollywood Center Studios on a, on a perfectly uh, terrible sitcom. And uh, there's an office building across from the lot. And somebody takes me over there. And on the office building directory outside, Dr. So-and-so, dentist so-and-so, podiatrist so-and-so, George Burns, this guy, next guy. Uh, you're like, what? George Burns? What do you mean? He, his production office is here? Here, come with me. And you just walk right in, down the hall. You start to smell cigar smoke. What? And you go, and there's a wooden door. It says George Burns, and it's open. And there's a secretary who looks about 90 sitting there. And my friend goes, is, uh, is George in? Sure, go right in. Go right in. Wow. We walk in. He's smoking a cigar. He's sitting in a director's chair. He's talking, talking to a young man of 80. And he says, come on in, boys, and have a seat. And we get to sit there and talk as long as we want. And he loved having visitors. He was 99 at this time, maybe. Wow. And, and, and uh, I would bring everyone I knew. I would do what happened to me, which was a surprise waiting at the end of this hall. Come with me. People uh, thought I was abducting them. 
And then they saw friggin' George Burns like Mount Rushmore. You're coming. I brought my wife. I brought my Monica, I'm taking you somewhere today. Don't ask me questions. Well, she she was like, I'm busy. I don't have a come with me. And we walk in and he's sitting there. He says, Hello, sweetheart. And she burst into tears. Oh my gosh. That's right? great. And 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 after about ten minutes, he says to my wife, he goes, You remind me of Gracie. Oh well, let me tell you, my my wife, she would have thrown me off the roof right there to go marry George. <laughs> yeah, wow, wowie, right? Never forget it. What a story! Never forget it. My my favorite George Burns story is some comic I knew was in a restaurant and he sees Burns having lunch by himself, and yeah. he walks over very and he goes, "Look, I don't want to bother you. Just want to say I'm a fan." And he uh, Burns invites him to sit down with him, and and they're talking, and Burns is telling stories and the nicest possible. Uh, uh my friend asked him what he doesn't like about comedy now, and he goes, "Well, you know, it's dirty now, and 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 huh. back then we wouldn't do dirty material. It was it wasn't respectful of the audience." And then he continues talking, and then he finishes lunch. He's putting his jacket on. The manager comes over and goes, are you leaving now, Mr. Burns? And he goes, yeah, I got to hurry home. I hired a teenage faggot to punch me up the ass. Holy cow. (laughs) Wow. That's a terrible story. Oh, my God. Wow. Where did you hear that? Yeah, some <laughs> Gilbert told me. Why do you have to ruin it, Gilbert? We had a beautiful thing going. We had a, it was so nice, your story. <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> you want to you take back that statement about him not being vulgar, Phil? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell them about Peter O'Toole too, because this is this is another oh, another legend God. that you got that you actually got to uh, not only meet but spend significant time with. Well, you know what Groucho said about Peter O'Toole. Oh, a double phallic name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me that Peter O'Toole uh, wanted to do a sitcom. This is the God's honest truth. This would have been nineteen ninety four. Okay, he he did a movie with uh, John Goodman called King Ralph. Sure, and John that was on his hiatus from Roseanne. And when John told him about the money to be made in sitcoms, Peter O'Toole said, "I would like to do a sitcom." <laughs> <laughs> so we get this call. Would you like to do a sitcom? I had a partner at the time, Oliver Goldstick. Would you like to do uh, write a Sitcom for Peter O'Toole. Boy, would I? <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> yeah, of course. Because he's the greatest actor. You know, are you there's very few people. Uh, somebody else kids probably don't know. Oh, of course well, not. Well, the people right? who listen to this show know. Well, it's friggin' Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. Okay. So what do you do with him? Well, you do a show where maybe he's uh, he's a, a, a guy in exile and he meets – he, he – reunites with his estranged daughter and the daughter has a, a grandson who needs Peter O'Toole in his life. He's a nerdy kid, right? And it's about trying to have a normal life if you're this woman, a, a dental hygienist, and Lawrence of Arabia is in your kitchen and won't leave, right? Uh, so he loves this idea and we write it and he gives us notes. And I'm telling you, it's the best notes I ever got on anything. They were so articulate and so helpful and so brilliant. Wow. We were in love. Now, we're in Los Angeles, and he's in London, and we're talking on the phone, and he's writing to us, and we can't believe that we actually are corresponding with Peter Friggin O'Toole. We do one more draft, and he says, I'm in. I think we should meet halfway. I'll see you in New York next week. And we fly to New York, and Peter O'Toole flies to New York, and we spend a day with Peter O'Toole, a whole day. It was like my favorite year in a day. It was unbelievable. You walk down the street with Peter O'Toole and cab drivers are going, hey, 
Hey, Pete O'Toole, how you doing? Hello, young man. He said, you know, he's a scarf flowing like the robes in Lawrence. <laughs> oh, wow. You're walking with it. We're having lunch at the Oak Bar in the, in the Plaza Hotel. It was absolutely magical. And now we're going to, this was for NBC. Now we're going to start casting the other roles. My phone rings at home. I don't know how this man got my number, but it's Judd Hirsch. He says, I hear you're doing a sitcom with Peter O'Toole. I'm in. What? Wow. This is like people are calling us to work with this man, right? I, I said, it's kind of a minor. Uh, he goes, I'm in. I'll do it like that. And we start casting the other roles. We found a kid to play the nerdy grandson, David Crumholtz. Never new actor. Okay. You know, he went on to oh, do sure. many things and he's a wonderful, talented kid. So we're like, this is really happening. And we're about to cast the daughter now, the Peter O'Toole's daughter and, and the mother of David Crumholtz. And suddenly our phone rings again. And it's someone from NBC. And they say that uh, the president of NBC uh, would rather not have someone with an accent on the network. And the show is dead. Oh. Yes. Is that unbelievable? Peter wow. O'Toole is someone with an accent. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't the era where you could just say, well, we'll go to Netflix with this or we'll go to Hulu with this. There were only a no, couple of games dead. in town, right? By the way, I shopped it. I went to every other network. Oh, you did? I said, I got this and this and this. And they said, isn't he kind of old? He was 60-something. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's and then we tried to do something later. And then nobody wanted that. He was too old. And then he died. But- during that entire time, that 10-year process, we stayed in touch. We visited him in London. Oh, he was great with my kids. That's nice. He came to my house. I have movie night on Sunday. He came to movie night. Peter O'Toole in my kitchen. It was unbelievable. People were freaking out. They, they couldn't speak. I showed him Beyonce. He'd never seen Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I, put, I put Beyonce on the screen, and he was leaning forward like, what is this? What is this? He was in love. Didn't you say let's yeah. watch uh, Lawrence of Arabia? But he said he'd I rather said, yes, watch. What? What? Yes. What movie of yours can we show on movie night? He says, if you show a movie of mine, I will not be attending. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I said, yeah. And and I said, oh, okay, we can show whatever you want. Is there is there something you'd like? He goes, Cary Grant. He didn't even hesitate. Right. I said, oh, Cary Grant, you like Cary Grant? Yeah, I do. He said, uh, uh, I said, what, is there a particular? He goes, talk of the town. He didn't even let me finish. He knew exactly what he wanted to see. And About that. Talk of the Town is a very Aww. interesting movie. I recommend it. It's from the 50s. It's, it's really good and really interesting. And when it was over, Peter O'Toole, in my little movie room, led a discussion. Oh, wow. It's one of the best nights of my life. That's wonderful. Yeah. And you're still, yeah. you're still doing, I read, it, read about it in the LA Times, you're still doing the Sunday night pizza nights at the house. Come on. Come to come when you're in L.A. You're both invited. How sweet! Got yeah. it now. Now I got to go to L.A. You know about yeah. this? Yeah. He has he has a, a pizza kitchen. He has a, a pizza oven oh, installed wow. in his in his house. He's hardcore, <laughs> and he has uh, he has whoever he ever whoever he wants to come over the house and hold court and show the films. He has them come over the house. James L. Brooks came over. Oh, William geez. Friedkin came over. William Friedkin it's came over and showed what the French Connection. Both, both French Connection and ah, Exorcist. Incredible. And then uh, two different nights and stories, you know, incredible stories. It's like this could be a TV show, just just movie night. I was right? going to say that's a Where show. I, it's, uh, that's my the next thing I want to pitch to Netflix. Yeah, and he has movie theater seating. Oh, geez. Like the closest thing to that would be like I, I mean, I heard like Hefner would always have movie night. Yeah, and I'm he'd just like get him. That like Peter Sellers and Robert Culp and all yeah. those people. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty wonderful. I've been doing movie nights since I'm 15 years old. Jeez, actually. because when I was 15, this new thing came out called HBO, and if you remember, that was the first time you could see an uncut, sure, uh, a rated R movie in your house. That didn't exist. There was no VCR. This was HBO. You paid money and you could see something maybe. Yeah, you the could 70s. See yes. If you're 50, yes. yes. you're yep. going to see some action maybe. Right. Wow. Right. And so every Saturday night, I'd have my two 
uh, other loser friends who couldn't get <laughs> dates over. And maybe we were going to see something because a new R-rated movie was every Saturday night. And we'd order pizza. Well, this endured through college. And then here comes VCRs. And then here comes laser discs, right? You were, you were a laser disc guy too, weren't you? Yeah, that's, yeah, cause, uh, cause, it, that's in that category of English words that sound Yiddish. <laughs> and, and and i i i just uh, the tv got a little bigger as i started to get more jobs in hollywood right until now i have this dedicated like screening room it's fantastic and a pizza oven in the house don't order out we're coming over what what's so strange what i always think about is when i was a kid I mean, there was not nothing, no good jerk off material available. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, you'd look at Marilyn and the Munsters, and it was a pretty girl. And, That's sad. And, Why is Gilbert closing the door when watching the Munsters? Yeah. yeah. And nowadays, kids can watch porn when they're like one years old. Things have I changed. Mean, it's funny you bring up HBO in the '70s because I remember Susan George in the movie Mandingo. <laughs> with, with with Ken Norton wow. and James the most Mason, shocking, wow. the most shockingly yes unintentionally funny movie of all time. It may be. It may it be is so wrong. Yes, and sh- Gilbert, you know this movie. I I remember it. Yeah. Uh, not well. Mandingo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Susan, Susan, it is. It Susan is George is the what most stays with politically me. incorrect <laughs> yeah. movie ever. It's, made. it's wretched. You can't believe it. You yeah. scream with laughter because it's so wrong. Yeah, it's so bad. But I, that, that's what comes to mind when you say the uh, you know the, t- the early TNA of HBO in the in the in the seventies. You can't that one. Can't, well, uh, do you remember when HBO first came on the air? They would fill up hours of like these girls in leotards doing yep. aerobicize. Yep. That's right. And they wouldn't, no one would talk. They wouldn't <laughs> instruct you. It would just be music and it was like porn. They were zooming in on these girls, sweating yep. uh, with was spandex. Was that HBO or something else? What? Was it HBO? Was it was it definitely HBO or I, was it another cable thing? Oh, I don't know. I was thought it was, it was HBO. Was it Cinemax? Early Cinemax? Oh, it could have been Cinemax. It was little videos. I remember yes. it was little videos yes. of, of like aerobicized. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Right? I, yeah. Sure, I remember. I just don't remember the channel. Yeah. But it may as well be HBO. Yeah. Some Someone is going to uh, write, uh, is going to tweet us and tell us. Too. Of course. <laughs> Phil, we, we, you've noticed by now there's no chronology here, and we fly around all over the place. Do what you like. But um, this I want to talk about, too, because we're talking about your love of movies, and you, you bought Laserdisc. You're such a purist. Uh, I saw a video of you going crazy. Uh, you were turned loose in the Criterion closet. Oh, Gilbert, you got to do that. Yeah. You know yeah, the Criterion uh, collection, the, oh, the yeah. DVDs are the the the. They, it's like a film class in a box, right? Because they have the commentaries and all the extras. Oh, wow! And they wow. they do these beautiful digital restorations on Blu-rays and DVDs, and they 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 were the first ones to do the the laser discs box that 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 had the the best the best uh, comedy lesson I ever got was from Cindy Pollack take talking you through uh, Tootsie. Oh, you sure. Can get that. You can get that. Yeah, and you're uh, you're on the Tootsie uh, on Criterion. You're on the Tootsie. I'm on the new one. I'm yeah. on the new one because I I know so much about Tootsie because I I kind of worked on a Broadway musical for a little while about it, so I became a Tootsie expert, and so they have me talking uh, to the camera, yeah, about about the the show and and, uh, and yeah the movie. Yeah, he. It's, I don't know if a better comedy has come out since then. Do you? I can't think of one. It's perfect. It's a perfect maybe film. maybe Borat. Borat yeah. has the biggest laugh. Funny, maybe big, maybe bigger laughs, but there, but yeah. but but for for a film, for the for just a, a quality of filmmaking, that's a perfect oh, movie. Tootsie is a genius uh, movie. Yeah, you know you've got Larry Gelbart working on that Elaine May, Elaine May ghosting. Yeah, yeah, right? and Murray Shisko and everybody else. And yeah. I remember Dustin Hoffman's character when he's his male character. I thought, well, it's Dustin Hoffman doing a self parody of Dustin yeah. Hoffman. Right, but then we heard it was um, uh, what's his name we've had on this show from Hot Rock, 
Oh, oh, uh, Ron Liebman. Ron Liebman. Yeah, we had Ron Liebman here. People have said it was Ron Liebman he was doing. That's a rumor. Yeah, that, that's who he was doing. Well, the, diff- the difficult, well, I can the tell difficult, you that uncompromising the actor. Okay, listen. The filmmakers will tell you that the whole joke of Tootsie is that that's Dustin Hoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we thought. Yeah. Some people have said there's a there's a Ron Liebman thread in there. I don't know where that came from. But he was difficult enough without having to play Ron Liebman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll go one. By the way, one step further. The movie Get Shorty. Yeah. Where Danny DeVito is the actor. He's doing Dustin Hoffman. Oh yes. That's based on Dustin. Wow. Hoffman. Yes. Get Shorty. That's right. Wow. That's right. Did you ever yes. read William Goldman's book, Adventures in the Screen Trade? Of course. There's all that great stuff about Hoffman and Olivier making Marathon Man and him yeah. just driving everybody crazy. Yeah. It yeah. has that famous uh, line where uh, Hoffman stays up for two nights in a row so he's good and tired for the scene with uh, where the interrogation scene. Sure. Olivier. He sa- Olivier says, you stayed up for two nights? And he says, yeah, yeah. He goes, you know what? You should try acting. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> but Phil Phil's in this video I'm going to show you, and yeah. he's recommending. He's they turned him loose in the Criterion Vault, and he's recommending things not not only Tootsie, but he's recommending wonderful stuff like Sweet Smell of Success and Sullivan's Travels, movies we've talked about on this show. Gilbert, you'd have a ball in that closet. It's yeah, the world's best closet. It's just filled with all their stuff, and you just they let you take whatever you want if you do if they if you, they if you let them film you. Is that New York or L.A.? New York. Oh, Gilbert. A field, oh, field trip geez. for you. Robert Osborne had him on, uh, Phil, and he got to pick a couple of movies for Essentials. That that's was great. so much fun to do. I, that's my dream. I love it. Because we were sitting there. I thought, wow, this is my job. This is my work today. Sitting in a big easy chair with Robert Osborne talking movies. And Isn't I thought... Great? This is what I'm getting a check for him today. And what, what were your what were your movies that you picked? Okay. <clears throat> I picked Todd Browning's Freaks. Yeah. Uh The Conversation with Gene Hackman. Great, Great one. Yeah. Uh oh, the original of Mice and Men with Lon yeah. Chaney Jr. and Burgess Meredith. Right. And The Swimmer with Burt Lancaster. I love that movie. I oh, yes. There you go. I love you for loving that movie. <laughs> That That's a great is a, movie. People remember, don't know that movie. Years yeah. ago, I was watching TV, and I was about ready to shut the TV off. And and this movie starts where Burt Lancaster is telling people that all of his friends have swimming pools, and he can swim his way home in an imaginary river through right. by going in each of... And I remember thinking, okay, I'm in. You remember who one of the housewives was? Uh, oh, well, it was Joan Rivers. Yeah. Oh, Joan Rivers. That's right. She was in it. And, and uh, Marvin Hamlish wrote a great score. Yeah. Everybody should see that movie. Yeah. It that, was, that's Talk about they don't make them like that anymore. That would never, that, that, you'd never go to a movie theater to see that movie. Anymore. It's low concept. They're not making that. It, it yeah. would never, yeah, it would never but it's get like, made. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a, th- I mean, it's a beautiful, it's just a work of art, I think. Yeah, I, I find it hypnotic. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Gilbert, you have very good taste, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time anyone ever said that. Yeah. <laughs> the term Gilbert Gottfried and good taste. Yes, I've never right. gone hand in hand. <laughs> yes, you'd never know with your potty mouth. Isn't that amazing, Phil? <laughs> yeah. You also See, both. You also both. The potty like... mouth is like a cover. <laughs> I, I told you, he's an artiste. Sweet, sensitive kid in there. Yes, he's an nice. artiste. You also yeah. both like Night of the Hunter. Oh, the best. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So my first job in Hollywood, I come out. You know, we have to get lucky. What are they doing when you first land in Hollywood? What job are you going to get as a baby writer? Who's going to hire you? Well, how would you like to work? You want to work sitcoms, right? Yes, we do. How would you like to work on the Robert Mitchum sitcom? What? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What a concept. What a con. I'm like, what? Well, they made a TV movie. Remember TV movies? Sure. Oh, yes, yes. He played a homeless man in Central Park. 
in living in a refrigerator box and three children who are recently orphaned come up to him and say, would you pretend to be our grandpa in, so we're not split up and put into separate foster homes in exchange for which you'll have a roof over your head? And Robert Mitchum says, okay. And that's the movie. This movie, they tested the movie. It became the highest testing anything in NBC history. Okay. Tested higher than the Cosby show of the 80s. Cheers. This family for Joe, it was called. Mm -hmm. Highest testing. So they had to make a sitcom out of it. Right? They had to continue. (laughs) So now Robert Mitchum is going to do a four camera sitcom in front of a studio audience. This is mind blowing. Robert Mitchum. So I take the job. Why? Because I want to keep eating whatever I want. (laughs) And. We get there and we meet the other writers. We're the youngest ones. Talk about forgetting the past. The older writers in the room have never seen a Robert Mitchum movie. Oh, How is that even possible? They've heard the name, but they'd never seen his work. I said, you're coming over to my house. I have a VCR. I have a a cassette of Night of the Hunter. And I put in Night of the Hunter for the other writers. To show them. And they laugh at it. They laugh at it because it has surrealism in it. Because it's not, because it's poetic. Because it's a nightmare on film. Because there are close-ups of frogs, you know, and and, and, and they run a little bit, you know, a little, it's a little exaggerated. Because it's a dream. They Mm -hmm. don't get it. And as they're leaving my house, great movie, Phil. Like, I'm an idiot. Wow. And I think, oh, my God, I am in a world of shit. <laughs> wow. This is not going to go well. Listen, I thought i meet Mitchum. It's my great honor to meet Robert Mitchum. Couldn't have been nicer. Had a bunch of Hollywood stories. I could ask him about Deborah Kerr in uh, Heaven Knows Mr. Alice. I love right? that one. He would tell me stories. I was the only one interested. Why? I'm in friggin' Hollywood. I'm the only one who cares about the past, who cares about this great film actor's uh, career. Yes. But God damn it, if he didn't, again, he knew every single line. He never complained. I said, are you, do you like doing this at one point? Because it was truly shitty. And he says, (laughs) he's, I'll never forget. He goes, I'm a plumber. I show up, I do my job, I get paid, I go home. He had the most professional attitude of anyone I've ever met. That's something. Okay? And this show, I started to think maybe it has a chance because he's truly funny human being. And so maybe, remember like William Demarest in uh, My Three Sons? Sure. Yeah. Uncle Uncle Charlie, yeah. Uncle Charlie, and he was really gruff and... That's where the laughs came from, from him being like, get out of here, you rotten kids, right? So I thought maybe there's a chance that he could be like that, that he, he takes the gig to have the roof over his head, but he really hates little kids and dogs, right? And so that's where the humor's coming from. Well, the very first moment of the very first scene in the very first episode that we're doing in front of a live audience, you have a Brady Bunch looking set and it's all nice and beautiful. And you, there's a ding dong. And from off stage, you hear, I'll get it, Robert Mitchum. And the kitchen door swings open. And Robert Mitchum's wearing an apron. And on his way to the door, he stops at the kitchen table and arranges the flowers and then answers the door. Well, the show is dead right there. <laughs> <laughs> because you took Robert Mitchum and cut his balls off right away. Why did they do this? Because... They wanted to make sure he was likable. Likeable. Yeah, big mistake. The worst word in comedy. Right. Next! <laughs> Grandpa, are you going to tell me where babies come from? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm ready. Well, when a man and a woman love each other very much and they want a baby... They, uh, they go into the garden and... Uh, what if they don't have a garden? Oh, well, they, uh, 
they go to a florist. <laughs> and uh, they uh, pick out a flower. They pick a flower, a, a pink flower if they want a girl baby, and a blue flower if they want a boy baby. And they hold it very tight, and they wish very, very hard. And that's it. Oh, thank you, Grandpa. Oh, you're welcome, honey. <laughs> How could they not even know what they had? That they this, this is a guy who's been... The show lasted seven episodes. I'm new off the boat, wow. and I knew. My grandmother would friggin' know. Wow. You got that a brand with, with Robert Mitchum, and they don't even yes. know what to do with it. A guy who spent yes. 40 years building a character. Yes. Yeah. You, you know what I... you <clears throat> When you were talking about Night of the Hunter, yeah. I remember being at Saturday Night Live, and me and two of the writers watched the original Wolfman. Okay. And afterwards, I said, I I really like that movie. And yeah. they said, oh, yeah, we do, too. It's so bad. Yeah. You, and, bo- you both yeah. had the same experience. Yeah. There's no sense of style, of history, of what they were doing. They don't take a class, people. There's more to just what's right in front of you. There could be thought behind these choices that you think are odd. You know? I don't know. I... I it's funny you both had a similar experience. You were trying yes. to educate people, and they missed yeah. they missed the point entirely. By the way, yeah. I wasn't even trying to educate. You, I was just trying to turn them on to something sh- great. Share something good. Yes. Yeah, of course. And you and, the, and you were the kid in the group, of course, which is which makes it yes. even funnier. These are these are veteran guys. You're what twenty or twenty one. Oh, and I you know what? It wasn't funny. Forgetting people, I remember. You know, a short while ago, I was watching. I think Harper on TV. I yeah, love that one. William, so, William Goldman. Yeah. Paul Newman is yeah. there talking to Robert Wagner. And Robert Wagner is joking with him, and he goes into a James Cagney imitation. Right. And I remember thinking, one, oh, see, now people watching this, they don't know who James Cagney is. Yep. And then it hit me, they don't know who the fuck Paul Newman is. <laughs> true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which it's is true. Un- unbelievable. Unbelievable. Isn't that sad? Yeah. And, and like when when my kids are growing up, they're 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 grown up now. One is twenty three and one is twenty. They didn't want to see movies that were older than two years. Yes. Yeah. Well, Gil- let alone let alone black and white. Black and white. It was like, why don't you just stick pencils in my eyes? <laughs> <laughs> see, Gilbert's done a a, jo- a good job with Max because you can get Max to watch the old oh, horror yes. films. Yeah. Yeah. Right. His son is eight. What eight now? Yeah. I yeah. I get him. I, I used great. to drill him. I'd he likes say, horror? Yeah, I used to say, okay, who played Frankenstein? He goes, Boris Karloff. Oh, is that adorable. <laughs> who was the Wolfman? Lon Chaney Jr. Oh, that's good. Isn't that great? <laughs> you've, done, you've done well. Yes. There was one black and white clip that my kids loved. Tell me if your kid, if, if you've shown this to your boy. In It's a Gift, W.C. Fields. Yeah. The Mr. Muckle Mr. Scene. Muckle. <laughs> with the light, you know it, Gilbert? With the light bulbs. You know that scene? No. Okay, please go home tonight and go to YouTube and search for Mr. Muckle, W.C. <laughs> Fields. I promise you will die laughing. You know the scene. Wow. Yeah. I don't want to give the anything blind, away. It's a blind guy. A blind guy, guy. A blind guy oh. in a store. <laughs> blind and uh, kind of deaf, too. Right, right, uh, right. Totally funny. <laughs> I'm going to make a segue here, Phil, because we're talking about Robert Mitchum, and uh, I watched Friends of Eddie Coyle a couple oh, of weeks yes. ago, which is also wonderful, co-starring your late friend and and colleague, Peter Boyle, who, oh. who Gilbert and I just adore, and he's come up on this show, uh, not just for things like Young Frankenstein, but we talk about him in Joe and and that movie and Hardcore and, and uh, so, mu- so many good taxi drivers, so many good things. I'll tell you two facts maybe you don't know about. We'd you know, yeah, love to hear them. One, he studied to be a monk. Wow. He went to the seminary. I said, why'd you give it up? He goes, not enough girls. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing I think that people don't know about him, do you know who the best man at his wedding was? His best man? No. John Lennon. Oh my God! They were buddies. They, wow! They they met because the girl he married uh, was a writer for Rolling Stone, and she w- came to the Young Frankenstein set. 
uh, to interview Peter. Oh, I love it. And so she meets him in the makeup. And she falls in love with him anyway. Oh, jeez. I Isn't love that it. Isn't that great? Yeah. What, what, yeah, what, the scariest I, night of her life was the honeymoon when he took the makeup off. <laughs> <laughs> I remember meeting Peter Boyle, and this was after Raymond was off the air. Yeah. And he was at some event, and he was really, really... In bad yeah. health. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, you know, sitting, his face was drawn, his yeah. eyes were cloudy. Yeah. And and I remember this was both funny and sad at the same time because I said, oh, well, now Raymond's off the air. What are you going to do now? And he goes, look for more work. Oh, I know. Yeah. He never wanted to give up. He never wanted to, you know. That's what kept him going yeah. as long as he could. What a sweetie pie. He, you know, the first year of Raymond, Ray himself had to move out here, and he was very nervous. Yeah. And he got, uh, like, an apartment that he wanted to share with one of his his fellow uh, comedy guys, Tom Caltabiano. And so they got an apartment down the hall in Century City from Peter Boyle, who also was here tentatively. He wasn't going to move out here. We didn't know if the show was going to work or not. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how long it would last. But Peter Boyle took him under his wing and showed him Hollywood and took him out to dinner and was his real, you know, pal. Wow. That's a nice story. You know, Ray wouldn't have uh, acclimated as well without him. Was that was that personally rewarding? It must have been, Phil, to to see you, you cast these people. They come from different worlds to see them not only gel as a as a unit, as a television unit, but gel as as friends. Jealous kind of a family. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the setup. <laughs> what do you What do you miss about it? Was one of the joys of my life. What yeah. do I miss? Yeah, the what, food what on you, the set. What, I know the food. I know you miss the food, but what you miss the writers' room? Do you miss the? I miss every. I miss. I don't miss doing the show, believe it or not. I love doing the show. I loved every second of it. I appreciated it as I was happening. Like I said, we were the very, very, very lucky people. Yeah. I treasured every second. But when it was done, it was done. And, you know, one of the axioms of show business is you got to get off the stage before somebody says, hey, you should get off the stage. Yeah. And so we ended it, and we were one of the even luckier. We got to end our show when we wanted. We weren't canceled. We weren't fired. When we had run out of ideas, we said, let's quit before we become lousy. Right? So the only thing I miss from the experience are my friends, are seeing them every day. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we've lost Peter, right? Of course. Doris. Doris, too. Right? Even one of the boys. Uh, that's sad. People ask me, you're going to do, are you going to do a reboot of, uh, no, no, that's a sad opening scene. What, what's the scene? We're coming back from mom and dad's funeral. That's not, that's not fun for the people. Yeah. You, you get to, the show lives in reruns. Why not remember it the, in the happy time? It, Why, when, you know, even the honeymoon is something I loved. When they did the specials later, oh, and they recreated the musical honeymoon. It was never good. <clears throat> well, also they I did mean, those, they like those reunions them. in the '70s were painful. Yes, you like seeing them because they're your childhood friends. But do what you want to remember them like that, or you want to remember them as they were? The reruns are. I, thank God they're special. Yeah, keep. I remember keep the new honeymooners. Yeah, uh, Jackie Gleason's there with that. Orange brown tan, <laughs> and I'm yep. thinking, how does a Brooklyn bus driver get a tan like that? And he would have a pinky ring, and and it was like, and also you knew what, you were looking at Jackie Gleason yes, now, not Ralph Cramden. Yes. Yeah, and and once again, what happens with a lot of these classic comics? Yeah, you know, like the Three Stooges and everything. Uh you're going. Oh my God, you know, now at their age, it's sad that they're in this little apartment without a TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny anymore. Well, yeah, it's a, a, yeah, and it's in color, which it's never supposed to be. No. Right, right, right. 
They did those it's, reunions it's, in the 70s when they were older men that were really hard to watch. You know, it's like Godfather 3. I'm just going to oh. pretend that didn't exist. Yeah, you and a lot of it, other people. It, it was so weird because Godfather 3 looked like it was made by people who never saw 1 and 2. You're right. You're right. So the 1 and 2... Best movies ever made. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's better movies in the world than those two movies. Maybe there's great movies that are as great in their way, but there's nothing better than those movies. And then Godfather 3 is just like, uh, let's take a shit on our legacy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He, he resisted it for years and years. They just kept pushing him and pushing he him. He didn't and resist long enough. No. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Boys, can I, can I, I hate to do this, but my parents are in town and they're very... <laughs> They're very, very old, and if I don't go home for dinner, they I may I may not see them again. Okay, let's let's plug let's Can I can I come back another time? Absolutely. Let's plug. I, It was my fault because I was late with the traffic, That's but okay. I love you guys so much That's I okay. could sit with you all night. We, I just we, uh, my parents. We have never had a brush off <laughs> like that in the, in the, all the shows we It done. was very loving and my, polite. My I'm sorry, my parents are in town. <laughs> It's I'm true. supposed to have dinner with them. <laughs> I know. But before I you... told them I'd be home by seven. I'm already going to be late. <laughs> let's pl- let's plug Plus the it's new very show. late for you guys. Don't your families care about you? It's very late. We're sorry we didn't catch you when you were in town. So let's plug the let's plug but the I'll new be show. Back. Do you want? Can I come back and? Finish? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Is it okay? Of course. <laughs> we, we 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 barely got into it. I understand if you never want to see me again. No, we I love you. Understand. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Before you run out the door, let's plug let's plug the new show. You don't have to. We want to. No, okay. It's it's called Somebody Feed Phil. It's on Netflix. I saw the first episode. I told you it's great. Thank you. The one in Bangkok. And do you think Gilbert it, likes that word? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know Gil, Gilbert is not a foodie, Phil. <laughs> it's okay. But I'm gonna, it's really not about food if you think about it. If you really watch the show. I'm going to make him watch it. He's going to like I it. I hope he watches it. He's going to dig it. Definitely the Israel episode. <laughs> oh. Wait till you see the Jews I've gathered for that. <laughs> Let this man so, go to dinner. So, okay. Uh, I love you guys. Gilbert, I've loved you for so long. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, I love thank being with you. you. Thank you. Well, this has been Gilbert and Frank's. No, 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 no not ah, that one. Fuck me. <laughs> uh, no, hi, I'm Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> I'm Gilbert Godfrey. And this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we're talking to nice Jewish boy Bill Rosenthal, who is blowing us off because <laughs> his parents are in town. Wait a minute, he did eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thanks to Mark Malkoff too for helping. He's a sweet love right? him, love him to we death. Love him. We love him. Absolutely. All right. Phil, I I really do want to see you soon. We'll do it again. Love to your parents. Thank you. Boys. Thank you. Bye buddy. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>